I mean, truly, guys, a, the son of a murdered real estate agent should not be having to create a nonprofit that sits in the middle of this industry to try to shape change. However, there's so much power in a story, and um, I think it goes to show the power of one voice. Not that I'm anyone, because Lord, I mean, she was little little old me from Arkansas, but um, hey, so be it. This is this is where I am, and yeah, I'm gonna keep pushing forward. You are watching the 10-4 at R4 Podcast, recorded live at Remax R4 2020 from the MGM Grand Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. In this episode, we discuss agent safety with Carl Carter of Beverly Carter Foundation from Little Rock, Arkansas. Now, here are your hosts, Jesse Peters and Michael Thorne. Welcome to the 10 and 4 at R4 podcast. I am Michael Thorne of Remax Lifestyles Realty in Langley, BC. And once again in the co host chair, Jesse Peters from Winnipeg, Manitoba, and of Remax Executives. Welcome back, Michael Thorne. Loving Podcast Central right here at the Remax R4 2020 convention. Exactly. People listening to this will get this uh, probably weeks and months after it's recorded, but we are the start of day number two at Remax R4 2020, and we start off the day with an amazing guest, Carl Carter, who in the intro only had the ability to say Beverly Carter Foundation, but is also a Remax agent. Where are you a Remax agent at, uh, Carl? Remax Elite in Little Rock, Arkansas. Amazing. Now, it's a 10-minute podcast, Carl. We could probably do a four-hour podcast with you <laughs> and not get through what we need to get through, but we need to dive right into it. Why are you, why have you become one of the voices in our industry, perhaps the voice in our industry when it comes to agent safety? Well, uh, tragically, unfortunately, my sweet mom, Beverly Carter, was a, an agent in the Little Rock, Arkansas area, and uh, a little over five years ago, she was she was targeted by two very bad people and they deceived her into believing that they were truly interested in purchasing property and they lured her to um, to show them a property and while my sweet mom was there and while she was seeking to serve them and do this this great work that we all do um, she was tragically kidnapped and with the intention to hold her for ransom and uh, when that didn't go as they thought that it would uh, they they decided to end my mom's life and so I, I find myself here um, trying to make sense, trying to make some good come out of such a horrible thing, um, a position none of us should be in, uh, a cause that it's a shame that we have to think about. But, um, but I am very passionate about it. And um, it's you know something I'll just add is a lot of people that I've spoken with, they, they know what happened to my mom. And so they, they feel comfortable with me and I feel so so blessed that they have a comfortability to say, hey Carl, I'm so sorry about your mom. May I share a way that I w I've been victimized while I've been in doing this work? And that could be anything from, you know, the prescription drugs came up missing during an open house all the way up to, I've had multiple agents tell me that they were raped while showing property. And so there's just such, there's such a responsibility I feel to, to help people in, in a positive, inspiring way, hopefully. And um, and try to j drive change. So. And and you've done that with uh, remarkable grace. Um, certainly, if if you if anyone listening happens to be at a conference where you're speaking or senior stuff in Remax University and all the other stuff that you've done and, and, and put out, um, you are. Uh, it's amazing. Um, we said this time before, but like, like someone like Bruce Johnson, there's something mm -hmm. special about having you come come out of this tragedy uh, to help all of us um, all of us agents and, and one of the things I want to touch on right at the beginning is um, you're doing this podcast with two guys in in, in, in their 40s um, but this this is more than a female issue in our industry and I think I think um, uh, some of the men in this industry can get a little cavalier I think in, in, in the past year, we've seen a number of stories involving men. Absolutely. And um, it, it is something that, and, and I will admit, it is, it's even easy for me in the, the, with the, the view that I have and the heightened awareness that I have. It's very easy because we are an industry that's dominated by, by 
these these lovely ladies, and um, and I've, I I hear stories you know time and time again about you know these ladies, and it's you know they've been put in situations where you know there's been some creep that that there's some sort of assault or stalking, um, but you're absolutely right. The, we do get cavalier, and um, you know we—it's kind of seen as a sign of weakness. You know, even if you're as you're walking to your car, you know that you don't look over your shoulder just because you want to, you know, look tough. And um, yeah, it's—it's it, it's an alarming trend, it really is. So, two two questions. Um, from the agent perspective, what what do you see as two or three things that agent can be doing? And then on the complete opposite side of it, what would you like or what can the industry from a higher level be doing to, to not only bring awareness, but actions that can be taken to, to improve safety? So one thing that's tough about about the safety conversation, and you know, I will admit, you know, before this happened to my mom, and I would hear that, you know, my company was offering safety class. It's like, oh, grown, I get it. This is, you know, very anecdotal. These are things I learned as a child. Um, but but what we find is that we're good, hardworking people, and we get complacent, and we start making decisions based upon the you know the the character that we represent, not necessarily being mindful of those that that walk among us. Um, so I always go back to my mom's story. My mom, they targeted her because they perceived her as rich. They and they had this elaborate scheme to to deceive her. What I really emphasize with everyone is that those criminals would not have done that and many of the crimes against realtors would not have been done if the bad guy didn't think they could get away with it. So uh, number one tip I would tell an agent is strip your prospect of their anonymity. Um, and that's, that's in, you know, whether that's ID, meeting in, meeting in the office, um, having someone else uh, handy, you know, a buddy, uh, just anything to really, really take it that next step, you know, working with the lender, getting the, you know, the, the uh, proof of funds, whatever it may be. So stripping them of anonymity is really going to be a great deterrent. Um, and then as an industry, I think that we, we have an, an immense opportunity. So something that I've actually seen that was um, implemented in the Des Moines area is that in, in when you're getting a listing, sellers in that market have the opportunity to sign um, sign a form that says all agents, not just my listing agent, anyone that brings a, a, a potential you know um, buyer into this home, by doing that, you you are certifying that they have gone through the steps of of um, you know ID. verification exactly ID. yeah and so. And, and, and you know, and I think any of us, if we were to talk to the general public, they have no idea that so often people are traipsing through their homes, and if agents haven't done their due diligence to, to verify who they are, you have complete strangers walking past your kids' pictures. And you know, I, and I'm not one that tries to instill fear in people, but it's like we can do more as an industry with that. We can um, not for the safety and security of these families, we can make sure that people aren't just traipsing through properties that haven't been ID'd. I mean, we can't even test drive a car without an ID. We certainly shouldn't be Or, or like, back in the day, rent a video from Blockbuster. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, <laughs> sir, I, I don't. Uh, uh, if you, I do, Jesse doesn't remember Blockbuster, he's too young. Ah, come on, man. <laughs> you know what, I was one of those uh, kids that never rented the movie. I would pace up and down looking at all of them because I could never make up my mind. And I uh. actually would leave and be like, didn't do it, but I had a good time in there. <laughs> it all logically makes sense, right? All these steps of verification, safety, for so many different reasons. But what is holding us as an industry back from this just not being switches flipped? Because this makes sense on many, many levels. And is it the work that has to be put into to get rules and bylaws changed? Or is it, oh, it's not as convenient now. Now I got to do 10 more steps. But just hearing the stories of what has happened and even what could happen when it's not done, I, I don't understand why this hasn't been an instant safety game changer. And seeing you speak at R4 last year, all of a sudden, for me, who 
be, had recently become a team leader. Mm. And I'm like, ah, I'm sending out my clients mm. to warm leads, cold leads, prospects, people they don't know that maybe I do. And I never thought about, oh, what's their safety? How are we checking in? What app do we need to be using? Or when I start to have female uh, realtors join the team, oh, I should really go through this checklist with this person who wants to see it before I hand it off, right? And it's just completely changed. So we have in-house safety. That's we great. have the communication. We're talking about wearable tech, but what, uh, and what else can we do? I just don't get it. What has been the pushback? Has there been pushback? Or why hasn't it, why is this not happening sooner, Carl? I think a, a large driver is that we, we see all the the disruptors and all these things that are coming into the market and try to make things faster and now and instant mm -hmm. and and so anyone that that tries to slow down the process in any way even just to stop and as silly as it sounds because you're right it makes perfect sense to to request an ID but just the thought of just pumping the brakes a little bit is 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 scary for people because they're like you know what if they contact Sally down the road, she'll go show the property right now without exactly. having to do it. And, and that's the interesting thing when it comes from an industry wide, this is the way we do it. In British Columbia, we just launched a new thing called DORTS, meaning we can't represent both sides and we must disclose before we start to pull paperwork from the other person whether we're going to re represent them or represent someone else. That's mandatory. Mm -hmm. So why can't we say it's mandatory before we enter the first property as an industry, I must have this information, not only for myself, but a copy submitted to my office so we know who you are. Like, you're right, it, when it becomes individual, it becomes a competition issue or, or a differentiating issue. When it comes from the industry, it's how we do it. And maybe it doesn't come from the overarching macro view, right? Maybe it comes from a team leader or a broker owner that says, this is how we do it in yep. my office. Mm -hmm. yep. Agreed. And lead the way, yep. right? Like it, and then also from a presentation side, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you have valuables in here. Your house, your children, right? Like we're gonna take IDs in, signing in. And you know what that does? Usually it spooks someone who's fake. Say, hey, yeah, here, no problem. Well, there's I'm too totally many checkpoints. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, too yes. many checkpoints. Right, but, it, but it's, you know, creating that path. But and you are creating that path. It's, but you're continuing to have to blaze it, unfortunately, but you're seeing movement happening. I, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I tell you, you know, I, I say this and I don't mean it perhaps as harsh as it sounds, but this, I mean, truly guys, a, the son of a murdered real estate agent should not be having to create a nonprofit that sits in the middle of this industry to try to shape change. However, there's so much power in a story, and um, I think it goes to show the power of one voice. Not that I'm anyone, because Lord, I mean, she's you know, little little old me from Arkansas. But um, hey, so be it. This is this is where I am, and yeah, I'm gonna keep pushing forward. Um, I do think a differentiator for where I'm coming from is that it it does have my mom tied to it, and she was yeah. beautiful and she was lovely. And I think that where we get it wrong sometimes with safety messages is we're scaring the mess out of people or we're kind of sure. berating people or just making them seem like they're dumb because they're not getting ID. And it's like, that's not a matter of dumb or not. It's just how can we inspire the change instead of scaring the change into people? Okay, so and maybe that's the, yeah. the approach, yeah. right? From another. One last question for you, Carl, is just a quick little blurb on Beverly Carter Foundation, what is it? Uh, how do people support it? And, and when they support the Beverly Carter Foundation, how, how does it get back into our industry, that support? So it, the, the Beverly Carter Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit and it is solely for the benefit of our industry. Um, I will say, um, you know, we have a unique challenge because we do serve this industry, um, you know, the, the, the general public, when they think about charities to support and, um, you know, they're like, okay, so I'm going to, you know, um, support a charity that, that helps the safety of these people that, you know, are just one slight step above a used car salesman. <laughs> um, so you My father-in-law owns a car dealership, <laughs> too. It's hilarious. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so that we have a challenge there. But I'll say, you say, you know, what does the foundation do? Um, you know, last year in 2019, we did 50 instructor-led classes in 26 of the states and two of the Canadian province, provinces. Um, we so we education is our focus. Um, the, from the classes to the webinars, um, I don't. You know, I, I will talk about this any any time I get the chance. So I participate in a lot of um, a lot of different educational activities, and then also we we do have an advocacy arm, and so I do push for. Um, and one thing that I was really excited to be a part of is that we just recently got NAR approval for there to be a new safety committee that is a standing committee that will function just like any of the other committees, from member communication awesome. to RPAC on forward. So that's that's a huge win. I think yeah. I think we're going down that's the where path. That be, where it begins. Yes. That begins, continues. Amazing. Yes. Awesome. Amazing. Now it's time for the R4 Rapid Four. All right, Carl, at the beginning of the podcast, we asked you to roll the dice. You did. Just trustingly rolled the dice four times. <laughs> Thank you for that. Oh, Lord. <laughs> In Jesse Peters' hands, he's holding ten nonsensical, silly questions, to which we're going to ask you four. Um, Carl's first roll was number one. Would you rather have noisy neighbors or nosy neighbors? Nosy neighbors. Okay. Always Why? on the lookout. Oh. You know, part of my safety presentation is you see something, well, say something. <laughs> Tie it right back. Benefits. Hey, I saw someone. Like a true politician uh, here. Yeah. Just pool cleaner. Thanks. Perspective. Perspective. That was my dad in the backyard. Number seven. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. How long would you last in a zombie apocalypse? Now, keep, like, I know you are a marathon runner. So, would that be playing to your... Yeah, I think I would be alive a lot longer than you guys would. <laughs> <laughs> what? Correct. That? What? Correct answer. That is absolutely the correct answer. I'm going to try entertaining them here. Hey, follow me. Helping <laughs> you get out of here. Yeah, there's nothing in the in the Jesse Peters social savvy brand that's going to help you in the zombie Good apocalypse. Lord, no. Uh, number six. How many chickens would it take to kill an elephant? At least... 6,000. Oh, yeah. Th I, I, <laughs> a, that, uh, how big 6, are those chickens? 6,000 or more. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, I think so the random. elephant might just give up. You're yeah. like, I am so annoyed and done with yeah. this. <laughs> Last question, just die. number nine. In those first few seconds, are you hoping it's ice ice baby or under pressure? Oh, uh, always ice ice baby. There we are. <laughs> Amazing. And that brings us to the end of this episode of the 10 Ford R4 podcast with our guest, Carl Carter. Thanks for joining us. My co host is the enthusiastic, incredibly, Jesse Peters. And, and I'm Michael Thorne. We'll see you in the next one. Over and out. That's this week's episode of the 10 Four at R4 podcast with your hosts, Jesse Peters and Michael Thorne. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Thank you for watching.